going on over here. By the end of the semester, it'll be, it'll be just me and the camera. Anyway, uh, uh, so we're going to continue with this business of uh, training neural networks. Can you shut your laptop, Sean? Shut the laptop. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to continue with this business of uh, uh, training neural networks. So what we've seen so far, we've, uh, can you see this little green dot, fading dot? I guess not. So we've seen that uh, a couple of classes ago that uh, a multilayer perceptron can be constructed to represent, can, can be constructed to represent pretty much any function, but just because you can represent it doesn't mean any network is going to represent any function. You've got to figure out how to construct it. And so uh, we saw that if you wanted to represent a specific function of, say, uh, a certain number of variables, here I'm showing this for one variable, then you would have some target function, which may be anything, and your current function, depending on the setting of the parameters, is going to be something else. And so there's an error between the two, which is this area. And we try to learn the parameters of the network to minimize this, the expected value of this error. Now, in order to do this, of course, we need to have the entire function, but uh, in order to compute that integral, the area, and we don't normally know what the function is. So what we will do instead is to obtain samples. Samples which are x, y pairs, where you get a certain number of samples of the input and the corresponding value of the function. And what we actually do is, rather than try to minimize this entire area, which we cannot, we will try to minimize the sum or the average value of these lengths. And if that average value goes down to zero, at least at those training points, the function is going to be a good fit, and we hope that everywhere else it will be a good fit as well. So the average that we get of, this, of these errors, this is a proxy for the entire area. Now this gap over here is quantified by a divergence function, which is represented as dive over there. The divergence function has a specific property. When the two values are the same, the divergence will be zero. When the two di values are not the same, the divergence is going to be a positive value regardless of the direction in which the two differ. And the greater the difference, the larger the, dif the divergence is going to be. Furthermore, as we will see later, we want this divergence to be differentiable in the sense that if this gets a little bit closer, we want the divergence to change in a manner that's quantifiable. So the overall training that we saw was process, yes? It actually makes a difference only in terms of how fast your optimization is going to be. And uh, so it's, uh, so long as it satisfies the requirements, in principle it shouldn't matter, in practice it will, right? So given a set, so here's how the whole setup works. You are given a set of training, training samples, which are input-output pairs, the x's and the d's. d is the desired value. And you compute an average loss over all of these guys and you try to estimate your weights, the parameters of the network, which are the weights and the biases, which I'll generally represent as weights, to minimize this error. And so this is a, an instance of function minimization. You're optimizing a function. You have a function. You're trying to find the value of the argument where this function is minimum, right? And so here's where we stopped in the last class. So uh, a quick crash course on this entire business of optimizing functions, finding a location where the function is either a minimum or a maximum. Uh, so what is the problem? You have some function of a variable x, and our objective is to find, in our case, the location where the value of x, where the function is minimum. So uh, that means that, uh, now this can be, the x could be a scalar, it could be a vector. So if it's a vector, you're going to have a, a, a function like the figures to the right, and there's, in each case, a specific value of x where the function is a minimum, and this is what we would like to find. Now, uh, the standard approach that we were taught in school, we know that when a function has a minimum, as you approach the minimum, the function is going to keep going down, and then it gets 
you, the rate at which you go down flat slow, uh, slows down and eventually you hit a minimum. And then when you go past the minimum, the function is going to increase. So at the minimum, you expect the function, the derivative of the function with respect to its argument to be zero. And so what we learn in school is that you just compute the location at which the derivative goes to zero and that's a candidate for a minimum. Now, why do I just say candidate and why don't I, don't I just say it's a minimum? That's because we know that not only minima, but also maxima have zero derivative. And so you have to distinguish between the two. These are what are called turning points. What is a turning point? As you approach a minimum, you're going to keep going down and then the function turns. If you're approaching a maximum, you keep going up and then the function turns. So these are turning points and both minima and maxima are turning points. And so both minima and maxima have zero derivative. The function flattens at the minimum or the maximum. There's one key difference though. When you're going for a maximum, initially the function is increasing and then it flattens and it decreases. So the slope is positive as you approach the maximum, then it becomes zero and then it becomes negative. When you're going to a minimum, initially the function is decreasing, then it flattens and it increases. So the slope is initially negative and then becomes zero and then becomes positive. So if you look at the derivative of the slope itself, the second derivative, you're going to find that at a minimum, because the derivative is going from negative to positive, the second derivative is positive. At a maximum, it's the other case. Uh, uh, the uh, second derivative is going to be negative. Again, all of these we, we know from school. And so the way we were taught to find a minimum is to find the location where the function derivative was a zero and where the second derivative was positive, right? Now, derivatives can go to zero for different case reasons. You can go to, the derivative can go to zero at a maximum. It can go to zero at a minimum. There's another situation where the derivative goes to zero. And what is that? Anybody? Pardon me? An inflection point. What is an inflection point? Anyone? So, Kinjal, what would an inflection point be? The first derivative is zero. But intuitive, the first derivative is zero even at maxima and minima, right? So, what else? So, Kinjal, what is an inflection point? No, so, it's, uh, so here's what happens, right? An inflection point is basically this. It keeps going down, let's say, and then flattens for a bit and then continues going down. Or it's going up and then flattens and then continues going up. So what is the sign of the derivative? The sign of the derivative did not change, right? And so what will happen here is that the second derivative is going to be zero at inflection points. Simply because the derivative may have been negative but then it became zero, then went back to being negative, or it, was pos or it was positive, and then became zero, and then went back to being positive. So uh, inflection points are another case situation where the second derivative can be zero. In fact, second derivatives can be zero both at maxima and minima, and you probably know from your exercises in school what to do in that case, right? So also all very fine. That's for a function of a single variable. What about a function of multiple variables? So the input is multidimensional and you have a function. How do you find a minimum? Once again, the minimum is going to be where the function becomes flat, where the derivative is zero. So the minimum is still going to be a turning point. The maximum also is going to be a turning point. So uh, what we want to do is to find a location where a, the derivative is zero, meaning a small shift in any direction should not change the value of the function. And we know something about derivatives in general. So for the functions of multi, multiple variables, multivariate functions, we have defined something called the gradient. What was the gradient? Technically, how, do, how did we define the gradient, Yang? Right in front of me, the lady there. So how did we define the gradient? Or the, yes. That's a derivative, a gradient of a multivariate function. What was that? That's still a derivative. We said for multivariate functions, what was a gradient? So how, what was it? 
it's, it's, a, it's a vector of partial derivatives, right? It had an interpretation. What was that? Okay. The of the so basically, when you walk in the direction of the gradient, the function increases fastest. The function increases in many different directions, but the gradient is the direction in which it increases fastest. So if you walk in the direction of the gradient, it's going to the, if you take a small step, for the, a step of that length, the gradient is the direction in which the value of the function is going to increase the most. Which is the direction in which the function would decrease the fastest? The exact opposite, going the other way, right? And so that's the direction in which f, the function is going to decrease fastest, and in between the gradient is zero. So uh, while uh, s the gradient has a second property, if I slice the function at any height, the edge that you will get is what, a, what is called a level set. And so it's kind of easy to show that if you walk orthogonal to the level set, that's when the function is either going to increase or decrease. So the gradient is always going to be orthogonal to the level set. It's a property you use all the time, especially when you're using Lagrange multipliers. It's dependent on the fact. You guys at the back, can you shut your laptops? And so can you please shut the laptop? You can, yeah. Thank you. So uh, when you're walking uh, uh, perpendicular to the level set, the, uh, that, that would be the direction of the gradient, right? There's also this notion of a second derivative for functions of multi multiple variables, which is called a Hessian, which is a matrix of second derivatives. The diagonals are the second derivatives with respect to one variable. Every other term is a second derivative with respect to two variables. And the Hessian is a generalization of the second derivative for a scalar function. Basically, the eigenvectors of the Hessian give you the directions in which the function increases or decreases fastest, and the corresponding eigenvalue gives you the direction of the curvature. So if the Hessian is, if the eigenvalue is zero, basically the second derivative is zero, right? That's going to be likely an inflection point. If the eigenvalue is positive, it means the second derivative in that direction is positive. So if you get a minimum, that's probably going to, if you, get a, if you get a derivative to be zero in that direction, that's probably going to be a minimum. Similarly, if the eigenvalue is negative, that's likely representing the location of a maximum, right? So when you try to find the minimum of a scalar function of a multivariate input, we'll, we'll, we'll look at Hessians again in the next class. So when you try to find the minimum of a scalar function of a multivariate input, first, you find, you have to find a location where the derivative is zero. That's a turning point. So you can just solve for the derivative to be zero. And so solving for the derivative to be zero is not going to be sufficient because there could be either a maximum or a minimum or even an inflection point. So then you would look at the Hessian. And in the Hessian, now remember, because you're in multiple dimensions, you can find very strange behaviors. The function could be a minimum in one direction and a maximum in the other direction. Can you imagine a function of that kind? What would it look like? Anyone? X cube. Can it, what would the shape be like? Like a horse saddle, right? I mean, it's going this way in one direction, and the other direction, it's sort of going down. So, in that sort of a case, you can find a location where the derivative is zero, but then if you look at the Hessian, one of the eigenvalues is going to be negative, the other eigenvalue is going to be positive. So, if you want something that's a pure minimum, every single eigenvalue of the Hessian has to be what? positive, right? So you would, you would run that check. In other words, you're going to make sure that the Hessian is positive definite. A matrix is said to be positive definite if every eigenvalue is positive. If it's positive semi-definite, if it's every eigenvalue is non-negative, it's either zero or positive. You encountered this in your quiz, right? So it has a very definite interpretation. It has to do with the curvature of a quadratic. The problem is you can't always solve in that manner. You're not going to be able to find these nice functions where the derivative will go to zero and you can compute the Hessian and you can find the eigenvalues of the Hessian. That's not going to happen. A neural network, for instance, has millions of parameters. You're not even going to be able to look at the Hessian. So, because that would be a million squared or a billion squared. That's out of, it doesn't, it's out of your, the scope of anything you can validly compute. So, when you can't actually solve for the derivative to be zero, you will use iterative solutions. And the way you will do it is you have this function, you're going to start at some point and say, and say this is my first guess, I think this is where the function is a minimum. 
And when you look at the function, it's not a minimum. So you'd look around, say, okay, the function's decreasing in that direction, I'm going to walk in that direction. And you take a step in the direction in which the function is decreasing. When you stop there, still not a minimum, repeat the process. And you'd keep doing it till you actually arrived at a minimum. So this is regardless of whether you're, it's a function in one variable or a function in two variables, the process is the same. You start at some initial guess, and then keep taking steps in a direction where you expect the function to decrease, right? Now consider what would that direction be? Now consider a function of one variable, a scalar function. So if the function, is, if you're at some point, and if you're looking at the derivative of the function, if the function is, if the derivative is positive, so let's say this is forwards, and the derivative is positive, what's, what, what is the behavior of the function if I go forward? Does it increase or decrease? It increases. So what must I do in order to go towards a minimum? I have to take a step back. If the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. I want to take a step forward, right? Very simple. So I can just come up with an algorithm which says at any location, if the derivative at that location is positive, I have to take a step back to decrease the error. If the derivative is negative, I have to take a step forward. I can, I can formalize it. I can say that while the derivative is not zero, I check the sign of the derivative. And if this derivative is positive, I subtract a step from the x, which is to say I take a step back. If the derivative is negative, I add a step, which is to say I take a step forward. And now I can, instead of just checking the sign of the derivative, I can uh, and having this if else clause, I could just multiply by the derivative sign, right? So I can say this, this is just the same, same formula. All I'm saying is multiply the step size by the negative of the sign of the derivative. So if the derivative is negative, then minus and minus becomes plus. So I'm going to take a step forward. If the derivative is positive, minus and plus remains minus. So I get a minus step. I'm going to take a step backward, right? And now I can collapse this further. Instead of just using the sign of the derivative, I can just use the derivative itself. And remember, observe that this retains the sign of the derivative, but also retains the value, right? And this is a nice thing to be doing. Why so? So let's say I'm trying to find a minimum. Typically, a function is going to have this kind of behavior, right? So if the derivative is steep, it means the minimum is far away. I want to take a big step. If the derivative is shallow, if the function is shallow, the minimum is close by. So I want to take a small step. So in other words, I can use the magnitude of the derivative itself to tell me how big a step I must take. And so the overall uh, uh, iterative algorithm is going to be something like this. You start off with an initial guess. And then from the current guess, you always take a step, which is simply the negative of the derivative times some step size. And you keep doing this till, the, till you hit a minimum. So this is your gradient descent. You keep walking against the derivative. Or in multivariate cases, you're walking against the gradient. You're always walking in the direction of the steepest descent. So this can also be used for maximization, right? If I'm trying to find a maximum, then I'm going to walk towards the derivative. So in that case, I'm going to say xk equals some step size plus the gradient. If I'm trying to find a minimum, I'm going to walk away from the derivative. So I'm going to say xk equals, you know, xk plus 1 equals xk minus some step size sign times the gradient. So this is the overall gradient descent approach. And when do we stop? You keep repeating this until either the derivative becomes really small, basically 0, which means you've hit a minimum, or Subsequent steps don't really change the function very much, which also is indicative of the fact that you basically come to a flat region. So now, this is the overall gradient descent algorithm, just written, in for, uh, written as a nice little pseudocode. You start with some initial guess. You keep taking steps against the gradient until you hit a minimum. How does this behave? If you have a nice function like the bowl on top, then you're going to take a bunch of steps and the steps will keep getting shorter and shorter because the derivatives keep getting smaller and smaller till you hit a minimum. If you have a function like the one on bottom, which has both min several minima, maxima, and inflection points, depending on where you start, you're either going to end up at the closest local minimum or the closest inflection, inflection point. 
So this is the general principle. Now, let that, now let's, what was the problem we began with? We began with the problem of trying to find the parameters of a neural network to compute a specific function. So let's return to the problem. Here's the problem statement. We are given a collection of input-output samples, input-output pairs. Over the collection of input-output pairs, you computed the average divergence, which we called our loss. And we want to minimize this average divergence with respect to the parameters of the network. Now this is just a standard case of function minimization. We can use the same approach that we just saw. But then what are the things that I must specify? There are many things over here which have not been well defined. I have to clearly define it. What are these input-output pairs? I'm trying to do a job. The neural network is not simply you know, an arbitrary uh, algorithm looking at numbers and producing numbers. It's trying to perform a task, right? So which means you have to specify these input-output pairs. You have to, what is the function that you're minimizing? It is a function. What is it that you're minimizing? What is this divergence? All of these have to be defined because if you don't really define these, then you have nothing to minimize. Everything must be specified. This is meant. Now, let's start with the function. This is the easiest thing to define. We know what this function is. What is the function here? It's just a neural network. Specifically, we're going to assume it's a multilayered perceptron. We're going to assume it's directed. What I mean by directed is that an input goes in at one end, it flows through the network, and when any neuron in the network has processed a specific input, it's not going to see it again. The information is not going to come back to that neuron. And it flows directionally from the input to the output. So it's a directed network. Secondly, we're going to assume for convenience that it's layered. What I mean by layered is that you can, that you can assume that the neurons are arranged in layers, and each layer either talks to the gets inputs from the neurons in the previous layer uh, or, or the layers before it. And every layer, the output of every layer only goes to neurons in subsequent layers. Now, there are very specific uh, uh, nomenclatures over here. That input layer that is shown over here, there's no new, there are no neurons over there. The input layer is not a layer, layer of neurons at all. I'm not even really sure why it's called an input layer. You could just call it an input. Those are just the inputs x. The output layer is the final layer from which you're getting all of the outputs. Everything in between are, are neurons that uh, compute intermediate values. And these intermediate values may not necessarily be visible to you because you're only interested in the output. And so you're going to call them hidden layers. The individual neurons over here, uh, we're going to, the, the, the kind of neurons that we've seen are neurons which look at an affine combination of the input. Everybody remembers the difference between affine and linear, right? Uh, the quiz must have helped you. Anyway, uh, so uh, you have an affine combination of the input, and then you have an activation function which operates on this affine combination. This is the standard neuron that we've looked at. And the activation function itself could be a threshold, it could be a sigmoid, there are all kinds of activation functions. But more generally, you can think of a neuron as something like any differentiable function of the inputs. Now, why differentiable? Why did we say this thing has to be differentiable? Anybody remember? Guys, Kiran, why was this supposed to be differentiable? You want to be able to wiggle the parameters a little bit and see how the output changes. If you cannot do that, then you can't use gradient descent because gradient descent is all about saying, if I modify this parameter a little bit, is the error decreasing or increasing? And you're modifying the parameters in the direction in which the error decreases. So you want this thing to be differentiable. Now, I'm going to assume through this course that the kinds of neurons you're looking at are the ones where you have activation functions operating on affine combinations of inputs. Now, the activations themselves can be all kinds. The ones that we, one of the ones we saw was the sigmoid 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus z, which we see goes from 0 and up to minus 1, up to 1. And the derivative of that, if you work it out, is going to be simply f of z times 1 of 1 minus f of z. Another activation that's quite popular is the tan h. But the tan h is basically just the sigmoid shifted down by half and then scaled. Arithmetically, exactly just the sigmoid shifted down a little bit and scaled. And so the derivative of the tan h is going to look a whole lot like 
the derivative of the sigmoid modulo these operations. It comes out as y minus f squared of z. Then there is the ReLU which is very popular and we encountered this earlier where the activation is 0 if the input is negative and 1 if the input is positive and, uh, and exactly the same as the input if the input is positive. So there is something peculiar about the ReLU. What is that? It is not differentiable at 0, right? We said we wanted this to be differentiable. So we are going to assume that the derivative of 0 is going to be is 1. We will deal with, we will we'll encounter this again later in the class. And then there is the soft plus, which is a softer version of the ReLU, which basically is differentiable everywhere. Now, and there are other kinds of activations that you will encounter as you go through the course. Now, there is a special kind of activation which I will call vector activations. Vector activations are a specific form of activation where you have a bunch of values going in and a bunch of values coming out. Now, in your standard network, if, I, if each of these was a different neuron, you might have observed. So when I modified this input, only this output changed. The rest of them did not change. When I speak of a vector activation, it has a, it, it, it's, it's a little more complicated. If I wiggle this guy a little bit, every one of these outputs will change. So I can write this as a function which produces a vector in response to a vector. And uh, specifically, if I'm looking at something like a uh, neural network, so I have all of these neurons, and each of them has weights coming in from the previous layer, right? Now in your standard network, if I wiggle this weight, only this guy changed. Here if I change, wiggle this weight, every one of these outputs will change, okay? So one standard example that you're going to keep encountering is the so-called softmax. The softmax looks like so. You first com compute an affine combination, different affine combinations of the inputs as many affine combinations as the number of outputs you want. The output is going to be simply an exponentiated version of the input, but then the outputs are all normalized to sum to one. Now you observe, now you see what happens. So if I say modify this weight such that this input increases, then because that input has increased and I want all of them to sum to one, the rest of the, in, the, the because that output has increased, all of the remaining outputs must decrease. So changing any one weight is going to change all of the outputs, right? So this is a vector activation. We'll keep encountering this again and again. But once again, the parameters are just the weights and the biases, even for the softmax. It's just that the nature of the activation is such that when you change any one parameter, all of the outputs will change. So now a vector activation is just a generalization of a collection of what I'm calling scalar activations, which is individual neurons. So you can think of the entire network as uh, every layer in a, in a multi-layered network as just being one vector activation, and that is a perfectly clean, good perspective. Now, a little bit of notation. We're going to see this in this class and the next class. At every point, I'm going to have a bunch of neurons, and say this is the k, k minus one layer. This is the kth layer. And the neurons I can number as 1, 2, 3. Over here, the, these are the neurons 1, 2, and 3 for, this, for the kth layer. So I would have a weight connecting, say, the first neuron in the kth, k minus 1th layer to the second neuron in the kth layer. So this I will represent as w1, which is the source neuron, 2, which is the destination neuron, and the superscript k is the index of the layer to which it is connected. Right? Just, in it, just the representation that we're going to use. Every neuron is also going to also have a bias. And so this bias, I'm going to just represent using the index of the neuron and the index of the layer. So this, no, this notation you will see through the, net, uh, through, through the lecture. Now, so we've sort of defined these input-output pairs. So we've defined the function itself. Now the next thing is the input-output pairs. What are these input-output pairs? The inputs, so here's what you're going to be given. You're given a training set of x's and d's, and 
where x is the input and d is the desired output, what the value of the, 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 func the value that the function must take. And the x's are going to be vectors. Every input is a vector of inputs. In response to every input, you can get multiple outputs. So you're going to get a vector of outputs. So here, when I say the, bi the capital X subscript n, the n represents the number of the input, the nth input. But within the n, each, where each of those capital X n's is actually a vector here with d dimensions. So typically in my notation, when I write lowercase x with a subscript, I'm representing the dimension, not the number of the input. When I use the uppercase and I use a subscript, I'm representing the number of the input. So I'm using the subscripts with two different semantics, semantics for convenience, keep that in mind. Now, for each input, you will have a desired output, what the output must be. For each input, you also get what the network actually computes, which is the actual output, right? So these, three, so these are three different things that we will be dealing with. Now, what are these inputs? What are the x's? These x's have to be collections of numbers. Neural networks work on numbers. So even if you're working on images, if you're working on text, you're working on speech, eventually you have to convert them, convert them to collections of numbers. So in the case of an image, it's easy. Those could just be the pixel values. In the case of speech, it could be features that you've derived from the speech. In the case of text, you would convert the text to a sequence of numbers, and there are standard techniques for doing this. We will see this much later in the course. Or you could have other kinds of real valued vectors. The output, now if the network is performing a binary classification, then the input either belongs to a class or it doesn't belong to a class. So you can just use a simple zero, one representation. And so now the desired output of the network is going to be either a zero or a one. This input came in, I want a zero. This input came in, I want, an, I want a one. So the desired output is going to be uh, uh, zero, one. If the desired output is real valued, no big deal. The desired output is just going to be the value that you gave it itself, right? It's just the real value. If the desired output is a vector of real values, once again, no big deal. You can just use the uh, real values directly. But for the binary case, things get a little more hazy in that the desired value can be either zero or one, as we set it. The actual value that you compute is going to be computed using a sigmoid activation. And the sigmoid activation actually continuously goes from zero to one, as we saw, right? So as we also saw, this number that it the, the, the number, the, the value that the sigmoid activation takes can be viewed as the probability of the class one given the input. And in the ideal case, you want the network to be completely sure. When you see an instance of class one, you want the probability assigned to class one to be one and the probability assigned to class two, class zero to be zero. If you see an input of class zero, you want the probability assigned to class zero to be one and zero for the other class. But in reality, you're going to get a, get a continuum of numbers. So x is going to be a real valued vector. D is going to be a binary value. And y, which is the actual output of the network, is going to be a value between zero and one. Yes? Right. You're getting it, OK. So when I have a multi-class classification, how do I deal with this? So here, for example, let's say I've got a deal, I, I have something is, I have a network looking at images, it has to tell you whether, whether it's a dog, a cat, a, uh, uh, a hat, a camel, or a flower. So now you have five classes, and so you need some way of representing, now these five classes are abstract classes, they're, they're, they're animals and flowers and things, but you have to convert them to numbers. So we will assign an order to these things. These five values will, will, for example, be in the order that I have given here. Cat is first, dog is second, camel is third, hat is fourth, and flower is fifth. And now I have a five-dimensional vector. And when I get an instance of cat, I want to give it a one in the cat location and zero elsewhere. When I, when I get an instance of hat, I want to give it a one in the hat location and zero elsewhere. So every class now becomes a five-dimensional vector where only one of the values is going to be one and everything else is zero, and the location of the one is indicative of the class. So this is what we will call a one-hot vector. It's one-hot because only one of the entries is hot, everything else is cold. So now 
when I have a multi-class network, the desired output for any input is going to be a one hot vector, all zeros and one, and a single one. The actual output must ideally also be one hot, right? You want the network to be very certain about what it saw. That is a cat, that's no way that's a flower. That's the ideal target. So the target output D is going to be one hot. In practice, you're going to get a probability. And the probability you're going to get is from the softmax, the one that we saw. So if I had five outputs, I'm going to get uh, an, a final vector activation if I have five classes. And the vector activation is going to have five outputs. And the five outputs are all going to be positive, and they're going to sum to one. So every value gives you the probability of a class. I'm 0.9 sure that this is a cat, and 0.1 sure that this is a log. So you're going to have each of those values is going to represent a probability. And the specific manner in which you compute this probability is that corresponding to each of the outputs, you get an affine combination of the inputs from the previous layer. And then you exponentiate these affine combinations, but then normalize them to sum to one. So this is just a standard softmax activation. You have encountered this in your homework, so I don't need to spend too much time on this. I assume you understand the computation behind it, but you can also see how this actually looks very much like a probability vector. And then here's the magic thing. If you use only two classes, the softmax is going to be more or less identical to your sigmoid, because the probabilities of the two terms sum to one, so if you subtract from the, if you just retain any one, that's going to be a sigmoid. So the two class version of the softmax is your sigmoid. So here's a typical problem statement. You're going to be given a bunch of training instances of this kind, maybe images. And maybe the problem is you have to determine if these images are, represent the digit two or not. So now this is a binary problem and your training data is going to look like this. You have a number of instances, and against each training instance, you're going to be given a binary label, which is either a zero or a one, telling you the class. If you have, uh, a, you're going to have a number of positive instances and negative instances. You cannot have training data from only one class, then there's nothing to learn. You're going to learn that everything is a zero. So you're going to need both instances of zero and instances of one. If you have a multi-class problem, like recognize this digit, then against each training instance, you're going to be given the identity of the class that it belongs to. Now the identity is probably going to be given in this manner. You're, go you're going to see the picture of a five, and your data will say that this is a number five. But then when you actually deal with it within your, within your network, you're going to represent that number five as a one hot vector. So if I'm recognizing digits, I'm going to have a 10 dimensional representation for D. And the number five is going to be a 10 dimensional vector where the sixth component is one because the first component represents this digit zero, right? And given many of these uh, examples from all of, the, all of the classes, the job, our job is to learn the weights and the biases of the network. Now, here's the last bit. We've explained what the function f is. We've sort of looked at what the x and d are, and also what the y is, the last thing that remains is the divergence function itself. And what is this divergence function? First, for our loss to be differentiable, the divergence must be differentiable. You want to say, what is, what is a small change in my weight uh, do to my overall loss? And if I'm not able to compute it, did you hand out the sheet? Yeah. So if you're not able to compute it, then uh, you can't really use gradient descent, right? So the loss function must be, uh, uh, the divergence function must be differentiable. Now there are different kinds of divergences defined. The most common one, the, the easiest one to understand is the L2 divergence, which is the squared error, some squared error between the target output and the actual output, right? Now it's written as half of summation over i, yi minus d squared. Why the half? The half is just an artifice. It's a scaling factor. It doesn't really matter as far as the loss itself is concerned, but becomes very convenient when you take a derivative. So if I take the derivative of the divergence with, with respect to any yi, what am I going to get? All the other terms in the summation disappear. Only that single yi remains. I'm going to get half of yi minus di squared. The derivative of that 
brings the two down, the twos cancel. And so the derivative with respect to any particular yi is simply going to be yi minus di, which is basically the error. And so now your derivative is going to be a vector of the errors for every single component in the output. And this can be either positive or negative, right? Depending on whether y is greater than d or lesser than d. Now for classification problems, we like a different kind of objective function. The objective function we like is, the, is based on the kelbach leibler divergence and is called the cross entropy. So if I have uh, a two class problem, then d is going to be either one or zero, or I could even represent it as a two-dimensional vector, right? The output is going to be either, I have two outputs, one is the y, one is the, so I can write this as d and one minus d. So there are two possibilities, either the class is a one or the class is a zero, right? And so the, the uh, divergence if itself can be written as minus d log y, minus 1 minus d log 1 minus y. Now observe over here that if the target output d is 1, then this term goes away. So you're just left with this guy. If the target output d is 0, this term goes away, and you're left only with this guy. In both cases, you want the output y to be the same as the d, and you will observe that this error, this divergence is 0, when y is exactly equal to d, right? So here, for example, if the desired target output d is 1, this term doesn't exist. Only if y is 1 is log of y 0, and so this becomes 0. Otherwise, you're going to actually have a, have, a, have a value. And if y is 0, what does this divergence become in this case when the desired output is 1? Anyone? What would it become? There's a minus outside. So when y is 0 and you desire a 1, this becomes infinity, right? When, y is, when, when you desire a 0 and, a y is, and y is 1, what does it become? So if you desire a 0, this guy goes away, right? You're only left with this term. So this becomes 1. If y is 1, this becomes 0. Once again, it becomes positive infinity. So it has this nice behavior. Now, something interesting. What is the derivative of this term with respect to y? So it's if the desired output is 1, this guy doesn't exist. So the derivative is going to be minus 1 over y, right? If the desired output is 0, this guy doesn't exist. This is all that remains. You're going to get minus of 1 over uh, wait. You're going to get, because there's a minus, you're going to get a 1 over minus 1. Y, right? 1 over 1 minus y, right? Now, when we were speaking of gradient descent, what did we see the, say the value of the gradient would be at the minimum? 0, right? So what in this case, what is the value of the divergence when y equals d? Anyone? When y equals d, what is the divergence, not the derivative? 0, right? When y equals d, what is the value of the derivative? Take a look at the formula, right? So here's what the function looks like. Let's say this is 1, this is 0, this is y, right? And let's say the desired value of y is 1, okay? If the desired value of y is 1, so d is 1, right? What is the derivative? Minus 1, right? So what do you think the function will look like, the divergence? It actually looks like this. At the correct answer, the derivative is not 0. Keep this in mind. So if you're just assuming that the derivative must be 0 when you hit the correct answer, that will not work over here, right? So also, if I'm looking, if my desired output is 0 and y is 0, what is the derivative? 
What is the derivative? Anybody? 1, right? So what is this function going to look like? It's going to look like so in the other case. Now you will see why this is much nicer for this particular problem than a L2 error. If I were using an L2 error, remember what is the L2 error? The square difference between the target and the real outputs, right? What would the shape be? It's going to be a nice little bowl. It's going to be a quadratic bowl of this kind. Right? Why is the cross entropy better than the quadratic bowl? Take a look at the figure and tell me. It's going to converge much, much faster. When you're, fa when you're even a little bit away from the correct answer, the function is very steep. You go down really quickly. Whereas if you were using that would, whereas if you were using a callback Leibler divergence, uh, an L2 divergence, it's a nice bowl. You're going to take your time getting to the answer, right? So uh, that's why in these binary problems where you have a guarantee that the answer is between zero and one, and that it's a probability, it's nice to use the cross entropy and not the L2. Questions? Right. Now, uh, so. Note that when y is d, the derivative is not 0, even though the divergence itself is 0. The same thing with multi-class classification. In multi-class classification, you're going to have this series of, uh, do I have it? I don't have a duster. <laughs> well, in multi-class classification, you're going to have a series of outputs, d1 through dn, where n is the number of classes. You have the outputs y1 through yn. And you know this is 1 hot. This sums to 1. And so you will define your divergence as di log of yi. How many terms will the summation have? Anyone? It's going to have only one term. Why? Everything else is 0. So this is simply going to be minus of log of y of the correct class. That's it. It comes down to something very trivial. It's very nice. And then once again, when you compute the derivative of this with respect to the uh, to y, the derivative of the divergence with respect to y, there's only one y that actually affects the divergence, right? As a result, the derivative is going to look like so. It's 0 for all of the components, and it's going to be minus 1 over y for the correct class. Now, you, you're, so, uh, now there is a problem over here in that if the output for the incorrect classes, you're not making any adjustment, right? You would like to be able to make adjustments for the incorrect classes. So sometimes we use this version. We, instead of using a 1 hot, again, this is just saying the derivative is non 0 at the correct answer, right? So this has the same property. When you actually get the correct answer, the derivative is actually not equal to 0. But then, going back to our problem, sometimes instead of just using a one hot vector where it's all zeros and then a 1 and all zeros, we will say all of these are a tiny value epsilon. So if you have k classes, then you have k minus 1 epsilons, right? So this has to be reduced to 1 minus k minus 1 epsilon. So you basically change your target values to epsilons for all of the uh, wrong classes and 1 minus k minus 1 times epsilon for the correct class. And when you do that, the derivative changes, right? What is the derivative? Because now when I use this function, this just doesn't just reduce to one term. It has all of the terms in it, which means the derivative is going to have components corresponding to every output. And the derivative is going to be 1 minus k minus 1 epsilon over y for the correct class and minus epsilon over y for the wrong class. And what happens over here for the wrong classes? Does this derivative act? What is the behavior of this derivative? I'll let you guys figure this out. But this is often used. This is called label smoothing. And it's often used when you want to sort of hazen your convergence. Okay. So 
all terms have been defined. We've defined the divergence, we've defined the inputs, we've defined the outputs. So let's get on with the jump. Here's the problem set up. You're given a training set of input-output pairs. The error of the ith instance is defined as the divergence between y and d, where y is simply the output of the network and a function of the parameters. The loss is the average, di average divergence over all of your training instances. And you want to minimize the loss with respect to the weights and the biases, right? Now, again, remember the gradient descent algorithm. This is just a recap of the gradient descent algorithm. For any function f of x, if I want to minimize it with respect to x, all I have to do is sort of iteratively keep taking steps against the gradient, but I can make it more explicit. In, for every single component of the vector x, I'm going to decrease the value of the, I'm going to take a step against the derivative for that component. So for every component i, xk plus 1i is going to be xki minus some step size times the derivative of the loss with respect to that xi, right? So this is the uh, general uh, uh, gradient descent framework. So we're going to use this gradient descent framework to train our network. So you have a loss, which is the average divergence over all your training samples. And we want to use the gradient descent algorithm. So what we will do is we will compute the uh, initialize all of the weights and the biases. And then for every layer, for every connection, we are going to compute the derivative of the loss, total loss, with respect to the weight for that connection. And then you're going to modify the weight by the negative of the derivative of the loss with respect to that weight. Right? This is just your gradient descent. Now this means we need to be able to compute this term, the derivative of the loss with respect to the weight. Now what is the loss? The loss is the average of the divergences for all of your training instances. So which means that the derivative of the loss with respect to the weight is the average of the derivative of the loss for each of the training instances. Remember, the derivative of the divergence for each of the training instances because our loss averages divergences. The, def the derivative operation is linear. It's just going to move into the summation. So for every single training instance, you can compute. Do I still have the plot here? So wait. Yeah, I have it here, right? So for every single training instance, you can compute how much would this change if I change this parameter. And then you can average that across all of your training instances. And that is going to give you the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameter. So this means that that term, the key component now, is the derivative of the divergence for any given training instance with respect to the, respect to the weight. This is what we must compute in order to close the entire algorithm. right? So first, some basics of calculus. The basics of calculus, this is stuff that you remember. I, yeah. Very dramatic. Okay. So, how did we define the derivative of a scalar? Anybody remember? How did we define the derivative of a scalar, Stefano? Scalar function of a scalar variable. So, but then we had an equation for it, right? We said dy equals whatever. I'm going to call this the derivative delta for want of a symbol. We call this dy over dx times dx, right? Or maybe to be a little more, uh, uh, a better notation, we said delta y, which is the change in y, equals dy over dx times delta x. This was the definition of the derivative for scalars. What was the definition of the derivative for vectors? Anyone remember? That two was dy, and then there was the derivative, I'll call this d for whatever reason, times delta x, but delta x was a vector, so the derivative had to be a row vector of partial derivatives, and so this was simply partial y over x1, delta x1 plus dou y over dou x2, delta x2, and so on. 
This you remember, right? Everybody remembers this. Now, rules of calculus. All of you must be very familiar with the rules of calculus. When I say f y equals f of g of x, right? Do you remember how the derivative rule actually worked out? Now, if I want to compute the derivative of y with respect to x, then that derivative was simply the product of the derivative of y with respect to g times the derivative of g with respect to x. And you can see how that works out right here. So here, I kept this away. So you can see this. I can say I want this behavior to be satisfied. And any term that satisfies this, any multiplicative term that satisfies this is going to be the derivative, right? So let me start off by writing over there z equals g, right? g of x implies uh, g of x. Then you're going to say delta z equals dg over dx times delta x. I have this written there, just repeating it on the board, right? And then I can say y equals f of z, right? If y equals f of z, then using the same rule, I can say delta y equals df over dz times delta z, as you can see, right? z is the same as g in my case, correct? So uh, then, but delta z, I can draw from here, and I can write this as dg over dx delta x. So when I close it out, this is the multiplicative term that multiplies delta x to give me delta y, right? So the derivative of y with respect to x is simply going to be the product of the derivative of, of f of y with respect to g times the derivative of g with respect to x. So verified, right? Same thing here. So if I have a function of many, many variables, so I have x, uh, y is a function of g1, g2, g3, and so on, and each of those is, is, turn, is in turn a function of x, then I can write that equation like so. Wait, will this work? I can write y equals f of z1, z2, and so on, where zi equals gi of x. This I can write, correct? And then using our original definition, I have delta y equals dy over partial y over z1 times delta z1 plus partial y over z2, delta z2, and so on. Just using the definition right there, right? And this guy I can expand, which is simply, so I'm going to say this is partial over z1 times derivative of z1 over x times delta x plus same thing, delta y over delta z2, partial of z2 over x2, x, delta x, and so on. Same thing, correct? And so I can put that in parentheses and multiply the whole thing by delta x. So which tells me that the derivative of y with respect to x is the summation term, right? Where it's going to be the sum of the products of partials. Everybody gets to see where that came from. It's very straightforward, right? There's another nice little way of representing this, which actually uh, shows you the relation. I can say x affects each of z1 through zn through independent functions, g's, and each of the z's in turn influence y. So I, can, I call this whole thing an influence diagram, which tells you how x influences z. This is not the same as your compute graph, right? This is just an influence diagram. x influences z1 through zn, and z1 through zn influence y in turn. And so if I, zn. So if I want to compute the derivative of y with respect to x, I'm going to have to sum the derivatives over all the paths from x to y, from y to x. Each path is going to be the product of the derivatives on each link in the chain. So that's going to be, the upper path is going to be dy over dz1 times dz1 over dx. 
plus dy over dz2 times dz2 over dx. I can sum over all of the paths from the source to the destination. And that will give me the derivative of y with respect to x. These influence diagrams are very nice, very convenient to actually figure out how things relate to one another and to compute the derivative. And we'll keep using them later in the course. And just to make things you know, concrete in your head, we have a few tedious problems in the quiz. Now, so here's how the uh, derivatives work. A small perturbation in x is going to perturb each of the z's. A small perturbation in each of the z's is going to uh, individually perturb x, perturb y. And so all of these perturbations add up, right? So let's return to our problem. How do I compute dy over dw? Now, I'm going to start off with, a, with an illustrative network. Questions, anybody, so far? Anything on Piazza? No. So, OK. This was the easy bit, right? Then, we get, then it gets tedious. I don't really expect that you need to be reminded of your calculus, you know, of your basic calculus. But I do it anyway because you know, expectations are one thing and reality is something else. You probably, most of you have probably forgotten it after you wrote your exam. So I'm going to start off with this very simple network. Just for illustration, this is two inputs, two, uh, and two layers, each with two neurons, and then a single output, just for convenience. Okay. Now let's begin expanding this. Each neuron has actually two stages of computation. First, you comp we compute an affine combination of the inputs. Can you, can you tap Vinay on the, yeah, he's falling asleep. You want to go wipe, wipe your face? Go ahead. Uh, all right. I know it's hard on that side. I am falling asleep on this side, so bear with me, right? So uh, now each neuron is actually a pair of computations. First, you compute an affine combination of inputs. Then you compute an activation on this affine combination of inputs. So I'm explicitly separating these because you're going to have to do this if you want to compute the derivative. I'm labeling every one of my variables, just again for convenience. Again, we're using the notation that I introduced earlier, which was uh, uh, that every, every weight is represented with two, two subscripts. One is the index of the source neuron. The other is the index of the destination neuron. There's a superscript, which is the layer of the destination neuron. Right? Yes. Yeah, starting from below. So the zero, the, the dots represent the biases. I'm calling them input zero, zero, one, two. Right? Or one, two, three. No, I think I'm going one, two, three. So uh, there's some inconsistency across slides, but within a, each slide, there's in, there is consistency. I've got to fix this. OK. Just I have to keep you on your toes, otherwise you fall asleep. Anyway. Uh, now, so and actually, if you go from that slide to this, I think things have already changed. If anybody can find out what's changed, good for you. Anyway, so if I, what I want to do is to compute the derivative of the divergence, which is not shown, with respect to each of these parameters, right? But to do this, first, let's label all our values. I've just shown you the parameters, but there are intermediate values being computed. I'm computing affine combinations for every neuron. And then I'm computing an activation on the affine combination for every neuron. So I'm representing the affine combinations by z's. Yes? So why do you use the It depends on the figure. <laughs> I think here it's three, right? I've I should fix this, my mistake. I didn't notice this. I mean, the TAs and I have gone through everything line by line, but sometimes you just miss stuff because you know it's too close to your eyes, right? <laughs> and so uh, anyway, the Zs are the affine combinations. The subscript of the Z is the index of the neuron, and the superscript is the index of the layer. The Ys are the uh, the outputs of the neurons after the activation has been applied to the affine combination. Okay. And now finally, there's a divergence D. So here's what, let's take a simple example. If I want to compute the divergence of 
the 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 uh, the derivative of the divergence with shown with the, by the red circle with respect to this same simple weight what am i really looking for i'm trying to ask myself how much will wiggling this weight change the divergence right that is the derivative in each case and i'm assuming you can see this dot changing this guy changes this affine changes the z changing the z changes the output of this neuron changing the output of this neuron changes both this one and this one right and changing these z's in turn changes these y's, which changes the z, which changes this y, which changes the divergence. So there's this complex route from the variable to the divergence. And we have to compute the derivative over this entire route. But then we can do this using the chain rule, all of the little math that we saw. But there's one little tricky piece over here, right? So let's consider just say the final activation. You have the divergence. You're going to need the derivative of the divergence with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to the z and a whole bunch of other things in the chain rule. But this has this problem. If you take, say, the activation at the very end, right? That's going, you need the derivative of y. So you have some function of this kind. This is y, this is z. And you need the derivative of y with respect to z, but that depends on the location of z because the derivative changes with z, right? Which means that you need to know what the value of z was for that particular input in order to compute the derivative. So as a result, you don't just, comp and this is true for every single activation in the network. So computation of the derivatives requires all of the intermediate z and y values so that you can compute to identify the location where you are and the, and, 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 the and the slope at that point. So the actual computation is going to progress in two steps. In the first step, you're going to pass the input through the network and compute all of the intermediate values. So here's the network again. You'd start off with some and see. Just for convenience, I've changed the index. Now 0 is the index of the bias. right? So uh, uh, W0j is going to be just the bias, and then you have all the other weights, right? And now, I can just say that the zeroth layer is the same as the input, is the input layer. I can just set y zero equals x, right? Now, here is the complete network, and all the computations that are going to be performed are illustrated in this figure. So, the first thing you will compute is the, the first affine value, which is simply going to be a weighted sum of all of the inputs, which is simply summation over i, w i 1 times y i, right? I'm not going to be, when I call out the equations, I won't be calling out the superscripts because it gets too tedious. So this equation is very simple. You can compute this for the, this affine combination for the very first neuron. In fact, for all of the neurons, it's basically the same computation. If you were to write a piece of code, it would just be looping over all of the neurons. For the jth neuron, the affine combination is simply the sum over all of the inputs, i, w i j times y i, right? And so now you've computed the affine combinations going into all of the activations in the first layer. Subsequently, you can apply these activations and compute all the y's, where each y is simply obtained by applying the corresponding activation on the z. And then once you've done this, you can take a step forward, and then you can compute the affine combinations for all of the neurons in the second layer, which is simply the weighted sum of the outputs of the first layer, right? And then subsequently, you can apply those activations and compute the outputs of the neurons in the second layer. And you can keep doing this going left to right to the next layer and then the next activation all the way till you've gotten all the way to the end and then you've computed the final output yn, right? For yn, I've just shown one vector activation rather than two scalar activations because typically if you're performing classification, that's going to be a vector activation like a softmax. So the entire uh, operation can, is, uh, can be represented using this little algorithm at the bottom of the screen, which is to say, I'm going to set the, zeroth y, the, the, the y values for the zeroth layer as simply the inputs. And then subsequently, I go through the layers and within each layer, there are only two steps. In the first step, I compute the affine combinations for all the neurons. In the second step, I pass the affine combinations through the activations. 
and so eventually I get all the way to the end. Now there's something uh, uh, broken about this code. Can someone tell me what? Maybe I can pull up a name, Kirti Raj. Something's broken. So I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the final layer. Tony, you want to take a guess? Rahul? So here, yes. So if the, if, for the final layer, you have to compute all the z's before you compute the y. You can't be computing the y immediately after the z, right? Because it's a vector activation. So that should literally, literally have been written as two loops, one for the z's and then for the y's, right? That makes sense to you guys? So I sometimes have these bugs here, which I introduce, which I realize in class, and then I pretend that I knew it all along. Anyway. Uh, so uh, here's the forward pass, pseudocode. I'll skip it, but it's basically saying the same thing. And all the pseudocode on the slides are, is correct. It has been verified by David. And so back there, you can wave your hand. Yes. If you find mistakes, catch him, right? <laughs> but uh, you can actually literally just implement these things and they will work. So we have computed all of the intermediate values, all the y's and z's, right, going to the end. Now, we are ready to compute derivatives. And here's how we are going to compute derivatives. We are not going to go from left to right computing derivatives. We are going to start at the end. The first thing we will do is to compute the divergence. And then once we have computed the divergence, you're going to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the outputs of the network. Then you're going to take a step back and then compute the derivatives of the divergence with respect to the affine combinations going into the final layer neurons. Then you're going to take a step back, and you're compu going to compute the derivatives with respect to all of the weights. And then you're going to take a step back, and then you're going to compute the derivatives with respect to the outputs of the neurons in the penultimate layer. And then a step back, and to compute the derivatives with respect to the affine combinations going into the penultimate layer. And then the weights for the penultimate layer. And then the output of, the, of, of n minus 2, layer n minus 2 and then the affine combinations of n minus 2. You go do it this sequentially going all the way back until you finally compute the derivatives with respect to the weights of the very input layer. Right? This is a very nice sequential manner in which you're going to compute things backwards once you have computed things going forward. So I have seven minutes. I can either sort of crunch all of the math into seven minutes, and there are about 100 slides, or I can record an extra lecture where we actually go through these seven minutes worth of math in about 90 minutes and take our time. So what I do intend to do is sort of quickly give you an idea of how this thing works, but there will be an extra recording and that we will, we will put up. And the fun bit is going to be in the extra recording in that all of this math is so trivially simple, you don't really have to think very hard about it, okay? So let's start from the end. I'll just spend a quick five minutes on computing derivatives. This will not be in the extra lecture, so I'm going to go over, over it here. So I have the divergence with respect to the, of the, of the output of the network with respect to the desired output. The output of the network is y, the desired output for, and again, all of this is for a single training instance, right? You're going to do this for every single training instance. You're computing the derivative of the divergence with respect to the parameters for each training instance, and then you're averaging the lot as the overall derivative of the loss with respect to the parameter. So keep that in mind. So this is for a single instance. You have computed the divergence. Then as a very first step, you can simply compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of the, uh, each of the outputs. Now we are assuming the divergence is a di differentiable function. And so, I won't tell you how to compute the divergence. We've already dealt with the divergences and their derivatives. You can compute the divergence, right? And so you have the derivatives of the, of the divergence with respect to every one of the y's. Now I can take a step back 
and use the chain rule and compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the z's for the penultimate layer, for the, for the final layer. The derivative of the divergence with respect to say z1 is simply going to be the product of the derivative of the divergence with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to z. Right? This is just the straight up chain rule. So remember, z influences y which influences the divergence. So it's a product of two terms. Did I lose you? Okay. So this is, I can write this like so, divergence of y which is the same as divergence of f of z, right? So I'm going to have the derivative of the divergence with respect to f followed by the derivative of f with respect to z. So it's a two-step term. The f is simply the y over here. And so now here, this second term has already been computed in the first, first step. So that leaves you the second term, which is the derivative of y with respect to z, but that's simply the derivative of the activation function itself, f prime, right? And so, uh, and the f prime is computed at a current value of z, which was computed in the forward pass. And so overall now, you have the derivative of the divergence with respect to z, which is simply f prime of the activation times the derivative of the divergence with respect to y. And you can do this for every one of your z's in the, fi in the final layer. Having done that, now let's consider this blue line. I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the weight for that blue line. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to the W11 is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to Z times the derivative of Z with respect to W11, right? The derivative of the divergence with respect to Z is already computed. What is the derivative of uh, Z with respect to W11? Now Z is simply going to be Y times W plus other terms, right? So the derivative of z with respect to w is just y. And so I can write this like so. Again, the y was computed in the forward pass, right? So I can say the derivative of the divergence with respect to w11 is going to be y1 times the derivative of the divergence with respect to z, which is, compute, which is computed in the previous step as you were going backwards. And you can use this to compute the derivatives for all of the weights. Now, you need the derivative of the divergence with respect to y. We've gone from y to z to the weights and then to the previous y, right? So consider this first y, say that guy. That y influences every one of the neurons in the next layer. And every one of those neurons has an influence on the divergence, right? So if you really want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to y, you're going to have to sum over all of the neurons in the next layer times the derivative of the divergence with respect to the affine combination z. What you're summing is the derivative of the di divergence with respect to y over as it comes through that neuron. That path is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to the affine combination z times the derivative of z with respect to, the, to y. And these guys have already been computed in the previous step. And these terms simply because it's a weighted com combination is simply the weight that connects the y to that corresponding neuron, right? So overall, when you take a step back, the derivative of the divergence with respect to any y in the previous layer is simply going to be the sum over all of the neurons in the next layer of the derivative of the divergence with respect to the affines, the z's, times the weight that connects the neuron to the corresponding neuron in the next layer. Now, I'm saying this with a lot of hand waving, but then if you go through the slides, I think it's got to be very clear. So, uh, we've tried very hard to make this crystal clear. So now I've co computed the derivatives with, all of the, with respect to all the y's. Now, it's trivial for me to compute the derivative with respect to the z's, which is simply the derivative of, of divergence with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to the z, which is simply the derivative of the activation function. Right. So now I've taken a step back and have a computation, have computed the derivative of the divergence with respect to all of the z's. Then I can take a step back and then come use the same formula for, as we had earlier to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the weights, which is the derivative of the divergence with respect to z's times the y's, right? And then the derivatives with respect to the y's and so on. And I, then you can just follow the whole chain backwards 
all the way till you compute derivatives with respect to the input weights. So it's a very simple, trivial little piece of uh, uh, algorithm which allows you to compute derivatives with respect to every single parameter in the network. Now if I write this thing as an algorithm, here's what it looks like. In the first step, you're going to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect, I'm going to go two minutes over, it's 1020, just bear with me. In the first step, you're going to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to all of the y's at the output of the network. Then you're going to compute the derivatives of the divergence with respect to the affine combinations for the output layer. I'm treating the output layer especially because it's usually a vector activation. And then subsequently, you just sort of scroll through the layers backwards. In the first step, you compute the derivatives with the, of the divergence with respect to the y's. And then you take a step back and compute the derivatives of the divergences with respect to the affine z's. But somewhere in between, off the side, you also get the derivative of the divergences with respect to the weights. And these are what you're going to use in your gradient descent, right? So if I were to write the whole thing as pseudocode, uh, here's what it looks like. The first two lines just show you the derivatives, com the computation of the derivatives for the output layer. The subsequent lines, First, you're computing the derivative with respect to the y's. Then you're computing the derivatives with respect to the z's that precede the y's. And then in red, it shows you the derivatives with respect to the weights. Now, it looks kind of complicated when I write it in this ugly manner. But it turns out it's pretty much, here's what it is, right? This is very analogous to the forward pass. The first equation is a backward weighted combination from, of the next layer. The second one is the backward equivalent of the activation. The term at the bottom is the only special one where you're doing some extra computation to compute the derivatives with respect to weights. And in case you don't believe me, I'll just use a slightly different notation where uh, I'm going to use a dot instead of showing a derivative. So when I say y dot, it's the derivative of the divergence with respect to y, right? So just look at the loop. You see that y dot is simply the weighted combination of z's. And then z dot is simply the derivative computed at the z times y dot. So if you, if you look at the forward equation, z was a weighted combination of y's, and then y was an activation applied to z. Here, the derivative with respect to y is y dot is a weighted combination of z dots. And then z dot is the equivalent of an activation applied to y dot. So basically, the equations, the, the pseudocode, the, the algorithms look very similar. Uh, I'll pick, pick, pick this up, pick up from here, either in the recorded lecture or in the next class. Thank you.